there are a lot of moving parts here, but I sense that global um, anger and exasperation uh, at Israel for causing this humanitarian crisis is growing. And there must come a point where uh, the Israelis uh, can't um, you know, allow the division with America to go any further. It is, after all, their main economic support, their main weapons supplier. And if this goes on, we'll get to the point where Biden, I think, starts to put restrictions on the use of American weapons in Gaza, which will be yet another step uh, of pressure on Israel. Now, Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron has accused Israel of demanding the closure of a key aid crossing into Gaza. He said arbitrary denials of aid being sent to Gaza is the main blocker to providing humanitarian assistance to the territory. His comments mark an escalation of his criticisms of the Israeli government. The comments come as Antony Blinken is in Israel ahead of a UN vote on a US draft resolution, which calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza tied to the release of hostages held by Hamas. Lord Ricketts, Peter Ricketts, the UK government's first national security advisor from 2010 to 2012, who served under David Cameron, joins me now. Uh, Peter, thank you for coming on the programme. Uh, Hi, Ruth. Good to to be here. Comments from David Cameron. I I mean, in in the world of international diplomacy, that's what passes for pretty punchy stuff, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, David Cameron has been exasperated with the Israeli delays at the border for some time. But the latest letter he's written to the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Alicia Kearns, is angry. I mean, overtly angry with Israel. Uh, and he lists the problems. Uh, he talks about some UK aid being held up for three weeks at the border. As you said, arbitrary uh, inspections, uh, endless delays, uh, very short windows. And so David Cameron is joining the chorus that Anthony Blinken has also been uh, using in recent weeks, that this humanitarian crisis in Gaza is caused by Israel and Israel's iron grip on everything that goes into Gaza. Uh, And so, yeah, that's a definite uh, scaling up of his criticism. Yeah. And in terms of the UK's talked out now, we've, we've heard a bit from the Australians that are getting a bit stronger in their criticism of Israel. Um, this this draft resolution that the US, Israel's strongest and staunchest ally in the world, is putting forward uh, at the UN. I, I mean, is that something that Israel have asked for? I, I mean, it sounds to me as if it's not really in Israel's interest to have an immediate ceasefire. No, absolutely not. I mean, I think in all my 40 years as a diplomat, I can't remember a divide as wide as this between a US administration and an Israeli prime minister. I mean, it's now absolutely overt uh, antagonism. Um, This UN resolution, I think, has been um, worked out with the moderate Arab countries. As you say, it calls for um, an immediate ceasefire. That's something that the Israelis don't uh, at all welcome. It goes further than that as well. And all sorts of other provisions in it, which go counter to current Israeli policy, uh, warning against forced displacement of people, warning against a buffer zone on the border, uh, rejecting any idea of continued Israeli uh, military uh, security control after an uh, end of the conflict. I mean, this is something which is setting out some um, red lines, which are uh, very much not the ones that Netanyahu wants. It also calls for a two-state solution, which, of course, Netanyahu has strongly um, um, avoided, uh, condemned. So this is uh, America lining up with the moderate Arab countries and world opinion at the UN against Israel. That is very, very unusual. It, it is. Um... <sighs> It also seems as if there's an awful lot of things that are going on here. One, there is the um, way in which Israel is conducting military operations. Um, that is, however, separate, though, from allowing aid into Gaza. I, I mean, it, I've, I've slightly conflated the two here, but there is a distinction here, isn't there? Yes, I mean, they're linked, because I suppose the Israeli argument is that some of the aid could contain uh, material that would support um, Hamas terrorists, weapons or fuel they might divert or whatever. So they insist on very meticulous inspection of every single cargo, which slows everything down. I mean, there's the issue of humanitarian aid linked to the issue of hostage release, because that is what will eventually get us to some sort of cessation and a ceasefire. And then there is the vital question of what happens after that. And this UN resolution that I guess will be passed this afternoon begins to get into that as well. It begins to draw some of the parameters of what a post-conflict situation would look like. There are a lot of moving parts here, but I sense that global um, anger and exasperation uh, at Israel for causing this humanitarian crisis is growing. And there must come a point where 
the Israelis uh, can't um, you know, allow the division with America to go any further. It is, after all, their main economic support, their main weapons supplier. And if this goes on, we'll get to the point where Biden, I think, starts to put restrictions on the use of American weapons in Gaza, which will be yet another step uh, of pressure on Israel. But again, this comes back to anyone in the world, and we've seen any number of, of people in sort of uh, both leadership and in opposition positions saying we demand an immediate ceasefire in Gaza for humanitarian reasons. It, it has to actually be honoured by both sides. E- even if there's a UN resolution, it has to be honoured. Yes. And, and of course, it's different to the Americans. That either the, ID, the IDF or Hamas would do it. Yeah. I mean, you're right. It, it's a bit different when the Americans call for it in, in as open a forum as the UN, because they are Israel's main backers. But you're absolutely right. The ceasefire only happens when both sides agree to stop the fighting. And we mustn't forget that Hamas is continuing to hold hostages, you know, continuing to prosecute its um, operations against Israel. So there are definitely two sides here. But there is a negotiation going on, I think, in Qatar at the moment about conditions for uh, a ceasefire, which might lead on to a a longer term pause. Uh, But essentially, uh, Netanyahu has got to make a decision that he won't achieve the objective he's declared, which is destroying Hamas. I mean, illustration of that is that having uh, stormed through the north of Gaza with immense destruction and now moved on to the south, Israel's having to go back to the north because they find that um, Hamas is regrouping there. So mm-hmm. destruction is impossible. Uh, but you know, we have to assume that Netanyahu at one point or another will uh, agree that they've got to um, hold a ceasefire uh, and uh, move on to the post-conflict arrangements uh, and get the hostages out as far as they can. OK, Luke, thank you so much for all that expert analysis there. That's Peter Ricketts, Lord Ricketts, uh, former National Security Advisor to the UK.